Well, that was a terrific introduction. Uh, Tony, uh, you say you've been hankering to be more involved with uh, mm. refugee issues, and that's why you took that trip mm. back in January uh, to look around refugee camps to see where people from Syria had, had, been, had been fleeing. What did you see that we can't see in the, in the footage? I, I think the thing that struck me was yeah, they're just normal people. They're sitting there watching TV at home at night. The bombs fall. They grab the kids in their pyjamas and slippers. They flee across the border to a foreign country. Everything's gone. They've got nothing. They're just stuck in this foreign country. They don't know what to do, what's going to happen to them. And it's that sort of desperation of their position that struck me. But they're just incredibly normal people. Mum, dad, couple of kids, grandparents, what have you. And all of a sudden, their life has just disappeared. I, it's just like overnight. And you, or you think, what would happen in a suburb in Australia if that happened? It's just incredible. I, it's just the absolute normalcy of a family suddenly transported to a, a different region of the world, sometimes different language and what have you, and they've got to try and survive. Mm. Try and survive. And you, 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 you found yourself in an informal settlement uh, for various political reasons, those settlements are in formal outside of, of Beirut. Yeah. And, and you peeped inside the tent, and there was mum and dad, uh, two young girls and a nine-month-old baby. baby. Tell yeah. me about them. Well, the other thing, yeah, the, the informal settlements are just shanties. I mean, basically, that's just another word for a little shanty hut, sort of hand-built out of boxes and stuff like that. First of all, they... Again, they try and recreate in this appalling environment a normal sort of a lifestyle. So it's impeccably clean and what have you. And the little girls are just huddled in front of a one-bar radio. Because it's, it's winter and it's cold, you know, we're there in January, trying to get warm in this awful environment. But again, the family tries to create a, a, an arrangement of normalcy, you know, in terms of how they dress, uh, eat and what have you. Even in these terrible conditions, they manage to be clean and tidy and orderly in their life. And, and you're life. right, they've even, they're even got a little roster going about yeah. who gets to be in front, in front of the heater. Of the heater. They do. The girls take it in turns in front of the heater because it's so damn cold. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, then you think, again, just a normal family. <laughs> I think they, <laughs> they, they had a shop or something and, you know, and here, here they are in this sort of position. Yeah. yeah. With, with no sense of what tomorrow... No, well, that's the other problem, is all of them said that they, all they want to do is go back to Syria. Yeah. They had a great life there, they loved the country, they loved, you know, loved, loved where they lived and grown up and what have you, but you can't see any hope of that. I mean, I, I can't see any resolution coming to the Syrian crisis in the short term, so... And here's this man, I mean, I'm struck by it, because that, that's how you... You wrote a wonderful article yeah, when yeah. you came home, and you and he, he looks at you and he mm -hmm. says, "You know, a good marriage is all a man needs." Needs. Oh, well, again, the the beauty <laughs> of they're lovely people. I mean, they're just the most wonderful people of Syria. And I mean, they're 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 deep, deeply family orientated. I mean, they've got very strong bonds. Um, the families have been through a tremendous amount, and there's no sign of disintegration, if you know what I mean. They, mm. it's, it seems to have bound them together even more tightly. And yeah. you met a woman from Aleppo, I think. And, yeah. you know, suddenly you're meeting this regular mm. person and you're yeah. chatting away, and they say something so out Appalling. of the yeah. What well, did she say? Uh, well, she said, um, oh, we were sitting at home one night having dinner, and ISIS came in and shot our mother in front of us. And we thought we'd better pack up and leave. You know, you just, where do you, you know, how do you, how do you get through that? And here she is, you know, with the family in, in, uh, there in Lebanon, uh, in uh, Turkey, trying to make a go of it, as it were, in this terrible environment with very little chance of getting back. So now you're on the plane, you're coming home and you're thinking, OK, right, we're coming back to Australia, we're coming back to business and politics and God knows what else. And what did you think that you wanted to do with, with that well, that you'd seen? Uh, well, two things. I mean, I started off with... We started off this thing to get business involved in providing jobs and training for refugees. And, that, which, and that's fascinating because you were saying that it was the first time an Australian business community delegation had set foot in a refugee camp, camp since the end of the Second World War. Yeah, it's incredible. It's yeah. It is. And, I mean, you know, the, the, it's the pull-through with these people when they come to Australia, again... Uh, the Syrians are very hard-working people. Uh, the Lebanese say their building industry is dominated by Syrians, even be well before this war. 
and they want to work. So I think in a social and ethical sense, we should give that an absolute priority, training and jobs to get them into the workforce. In a self-interested way, in an economic sense, of course, it makes great sense as well. But so I, I felt that the jobs part of it was not really getting the attention it deserved. Mm. I still think uh, we've got good support from the business community, but I think they could do a lot more. In what way? Well, just saying, well, we will take refugees, we will take them, we will train them. We, a lot of them don't have English. We'll help them with their English language lessons and all that sort of thing. So if every business in Australia took one, I mean, we'd, be, we'd have the position fixed overnight. But we have big companies like Kmart and ANZ and Programmed and Aussie Post, of course, led by Ahmed Fahour's in there and, and Spotless is another one. So we've got some big companies already committed and, and starting to do some work in that area. But see, the thing, you know, the thing we're avoiding, which our earlier speakers mm. have touched on, is we're all swimming in the same soup, aren't we? Well, yeah. You know, business is, is, is no different. People are, don't suddenly change their attitudes when they come to work. They don't. Um, and, 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 and you've been concerned mm. about uh, the level of debate about refugees in Australia. Yeah, I think it's taken an ugly turn at times, and that, that worries me. I, it, they, I, I come back to they're just normal people. <laughs> <laughs> they're just, what are they fleeing? They're fleeing despots, terrorists and what have you. They're just normal people. All they want is a better life for them and their children. That's all they want. Mm. The work that the UNHCR is doing there is remarkable. That was the other big point of this trip. You know, UNHCR, I think UN, oh, I'm not sure about the UN. Go there, I'm a convert. I'm an absolute convert. The work they do is truly remarkable. These people work, you know, 80 hours a week. They have to make terrible choices, terrible choices because of the lack of resources on prioritisation and stuff. I don't know how they do it every day, but they do it, and thank God they're there, because if they weren't there, it'd be a real catastrophe.